This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with an apology, because that seems to be the tradition. Um, I'm going to apologize for giving you a rather personal take on this uh, remit that I had. And it's not going to be um, beautiful scholarly papers presented by uh, my two previous um, panelists uh, on, on this particular panel. But I'm going to uh, hope that, because this is largely a gathering of archivists, um, I thought it might be quite useful uh, to, to tell my story of how I think about archives and how I go about sort of using archives in my, um, in my research. So how do I undertake primary sources research um, in writing global history? What I hope to do is I'm going to take you through sort of three different journeys, archival journeys that I made in three different um, research projects that I've been involved in in the past two decades. And, and trying to situate UK archives in my mental mapping of global archives. So as a historian, I've worked on a number of different research areas. And one thing I'm not, I suppose, is a historian of the British Empire. So you're not going to get a, you might be quite interesting in that sense, that how does a non-historian of the British Empire who deals with global history use UK archives? And so it's, my projects have taken me to uh, many different research areas, um, all of which involving non-European um, areas. And it, uh, they entailed different approaches to locating useful primary sources. And each time, uh, it's, I, I haven't been, uh, I've left quite a lot of carbon footprints around the world, um, uh, regrettably. So when I come up with my research topics um, normally, I don't think about practical issues um, such as, you know, can I access the sources? Um, is it feasible? I just sort of have this idea. And my primary driving force is almost always intellectual. And then it becomes a challenge, which I actually enjoy doing, in trying to figure out how to do it. Um, so I have a rather kind of idealistic view of um, conducting research. And it's, it's, kind of, it's really quite completely driven by um, my intellectual interest at any given time. So. Um, my, from my experience, um, how one uses UK archives for uh, research um, in global history depends obviously on a number of factors. So first of all, uh, the reliance on uh, UK archives depends on the research topic itself. It's an, obvious uh, it's an obvious statement, but this is actually quite central. How central are UK-based archives or sources to my research? That's what I think about, number one. And then secondly, um, how easy is it for me to access archives in other countries? So the number one uh, question under this category is the funding itself. Do I have any funding to do this? Um, and I think funding determines really um, probably to the largest extent uh, once, you know, um, accessibility to archives around the world. Now, secondly, there is actually the question of access itself. So what do I mean by this? Well, first of all, there is the problem of physical access to archives themselves. We are incredibly fortunate to be based in UK where we don't have, um, generally speaking, archives is something that we take for granted because we're so fortunate. Uh, we can access all these archives that, that are around us without any problems, and um, you know you you almost always assume that there are things um, in there uh, because you know they're there to be shown to us. Um, but it's not the case in most countries in the world. Um, so you know this idea of applying for research permit, research visas, which could take up to nine to 12 months at a time. So you've got to factor all these things in. Um, and so that actually becomes a major impediment in, in some sense. And secondly, um, there is another level of access, which I'm always um, sort of quite puzzled by, which is that 
just because an archive is accessible in, let's say, you know, different parts of the world, uh, it doesn't actually mean that you can access all the materials, right? Because if the information is not given to you in a very easily comprehensible style, then even though there may be materials there, uh, you may not be able to access them. You may not even know that they're there. So this is, I think, one of the issues about interfacing between um, the materials held in these archives and also the accessibility from the user's point of view. And I'm sure archivists are the people <laughs> who are principally um, um, uh, you know, important in, in, in allowing uh, people like us to, to be able to use these materials. But the role of the archivists is actually um, one of the big things uh, which, which causes often problems because archivists do not exist in most countries uh, or most archives in the world. Um, and also controlling access to the materials which these archives hold um, by doing lots of things like um, slowing you down uh, as a researcher tremendously by not allowing you to photocopy materials. So you have to physically sit in the archives and, and copy them down in pencil. Those kind of things can slow one so considerably and I think it actually means um, it's one of the ways of restricting um, access to archives and also the exorbitant cost of photocopying uh, used to be the case um, and also not allowing digital copies to be made is also another problem. Now, so the third question is sort of related to my first one, is, is this, as a UK based scholar, um, how can I use UK archives um, as, a, um, as a backup to what I do? and for want of a better word, uh, as reference archives for my research in various areas. So basically the way I see uh, UK archives is it's sort of like a backup. In case I can't access something somewhere which may be more relevant, um, I, I kind of go to Q or you know, some other archive in the UK and hope that I might be able to find something which is more kind of circumstantially relevant, but still relevant enough for, for my research topic. Now, so um, it's worth noting that my, t uh, my title of today's talk, which is um, a connected story of global archives from the UK, East Asia to the United States, uh, was not plucked out of thin air, but has practical resonance for me. Um, visiting archives in these three regions uh, seems to have become an established routine in my, um, uh, in, my archival, in my archival journey that I've taken on all three uh, major research projects so far. So, um, I think this points to the importance of um, gaining familiarity with a number of readily accessible key archives um, around the world um, in one's research career as a global historian. So you got to know a number of them and to know how to go about using them without spending too much time. Now, the second point that I like to emphasize is that I always think of archives um, comparatively so in other words, uh, where could I obtain which materials? Sometimes the same materials are easier to obtain in Japan than in the United States, let's say. Um, because ultimately, it's, it's much to do with funding as well as about the good use of one's time. Because we're all kind of uh, limited in, in, in the time that we have. So in my case, my mental mapping of archives uh, has three core centers, uh, the UK, Japan, and the United States. And I rationalize my research trips by trying to see uh, what I can gather in these three uh, core centers before I determine which materials I need to obtain by venturing further afield um, to other parts of the world. So my first project, I'm just going to um, go through the three major projects I did in order to show, um, illustrate um, how I used uh, some of the archives in, in these projects. So the first one was my doctoral dissertation um, at Oxford, um, and it was an international history project on uh, Japan's participation at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, and the responses of the British Empire delegation and the United States. And so this was um, basically looking at uh, the three protagonist story, the United States, Japan, and the British Empire. And mostly I looked at diplomatic documents, um, private papers of statesmen, um, and newspapers. 
Now, because it was my doctoral dissertation, I hardly had any funding to undertake my research abroad. So this was the project that really got, um, uh, got me, uh, for, well, made me familiar with Q, uh, what we used to call public record office, PRO. Um, and I, that was my sort of principal archive from which I conducted other research, so to speak. And I had a very small amount of money to go to the United States, so I did go to the United States and I covered National Archives, um, the Library of Congress, Yale, Princeton and Columbia Universities basically to see private papers. And then I also had a three months um, visiting scholarship to the University of Tokyo. So I went to look at the Japanese sources, um, particularly the Diplomatic Record Office, um, the National Diet Library, which is the British Library equal, equivalent in Tokyo, and the University of Tokyo facilities. Now, I, I just I might just mention a few words about the Japanese archives, official archives. The official state documents in Japan um, are, not ha are housed in separate ministerial archives, so we don't have a queue where you can just go and you can sort of um, look at a whole range of um, ministerial archives. You have to go to individual ministries. Um, although there is a thing called the National Archives in Japan too, so there is a building called the National Archives in Tokyo, but they don't seem to have very many things there. And I, I was trying to figure out why they don't have many things there. And um, the reason is that they mostly hold materials which had been sent directly to the Prime Minister's office. So it's basically like a cabinet office archives, and it's not the entire kind of you know, bureaucratic um, uh, ministerial archives. Um, so it's a very different interpretation of what constitutes national archives in Japan. So don't be fooled if you go to Japan and think that you're gonna get everything in the national archives in Tokyo. Now, the archive that I got to know really well was the diplomatic archives, um, uh, which is obviously again in Tokyo. But this archives, um, and also just as um, uh, in the cases of other Japanese archives, have a, a number of extraneous factors that affected uh, their collections. The most obvious one is the Second World War. Um, you may know that Japan got bombed, you know, more than 100, uh, Tokyo got bombed more than 100 times in the last year uh, of the Second World War. And so basically a lot of things were burnt. Now, on top of that, um, when Japan was defeated in August, mid-August 1945, it took about two weeks for the Allied forces, the American forces, to land in Japan. So during those two weeks, it's a famous story that you saw kind of fire burning obviously everywhere in Tokyo, but ministries were also busy burning documents. So when, when you go to Japanese archives and tell you that they were burnt, you don't really know what kind of burning it went through, whether it was the bombing, fire bombings, or whether it was actually the intention of bombing, uh, uh, intention of burning of the uh, papers after the, um, after the, after the war. Now, um, the Diplomatic Archives was established in 1971 to preserve records from the end of the Tokugawa period, so basically it's sort of mid-19th century, to 1945. And it is housed separately in a completely separate building far away from the main Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it, it's actually part of the, um, the Foreign Ministry's guest house. So it sort of stands in a rather grand part of Tokyo. And what they do is, obviously, they, they have um, you know, files and files of documents, but also one of the principal jobs is to publish official um, document uh, publications. And they are the ones that most Japanese scholars depend on. And they use uh, these documents all the time. And what I realized what was that uh, different academic communities have different attitudes towards the use of primary documents. For example, in Japan, it is completely acceptable to just use the published documents uh, published by these ministries and not go to archives. So um, when, you know, because of my first research being in Japan, when I kind of assumed that it was the case also here, um, I had kind of, you know, these looks from my colleagues and professors saying, well, didn't you check to see 
whether the ones which were included in the published documents actually incorporated everything in the archives. And that's when I began to realize that actually, um, perhaps the Japanese scholars, um, some of them lack critical kind of um, attitudes towards what's been given to them, you know, as, as kind of very accessible, easily, um, um, easily usable uh, published documents. Now, another thing that I realized was that um, when, when I was looking at this particular issue called the racial equality proposal, um, I went to the diplomatic archives and I asked, obviously I spoke to who I thought was an archivist, uh, but who, who actually wasn't an archivist, but I didn't know that they didn't have an archivist in, in, in the diplomatic archives. And they, they gave me three uh, sort of bound volumes, quite thick three volumes of um, uh, documents. And I said, well, is this all? And they said, yes. And I said, well, surely for something as important as this, there's got to be some more materials, because I had been already, uh, you know, I was already used to using the Q um, PRO, so I thought, this is very strange. But anyway, um, so I, I went on to find somebody who could explain to me how they um, grouped docu documents. And apparently what happens with the Japanese foreign ministry is that they um, group, uh, the documents are grouped according to the sort of classified um, categories provided by the documents section of the Japanese foreign ministry. So these are the people who put particular, you know, telegraphs and letters and all that into boxes and they each have a label of topic labels. So my label would say the racial equality proposal and they put all the papers they think are relevant in that particular sort of filing cabinet and they become bound as uh, volumes. And this explained to me why previous scholars on, um, who worked on this topic always came out with the same conclusion, <laughs> because they always looked at these three bound documents. And so I was just some um, kind of young, cocky scholar thinking, oh, well, this can't be true. And so I, I, I started looking at sources and you know, other, other files in order to see other whether I could come up with a different interpretation. But that actually shows, you know, to me something quite, okay, sorry, um, important about how the way a certain ministry, ministerial archives, how they categorize um, uh, materials can determine the way historians interpret materials. And also it could even have an impact on the historiographical interpretation uh, of, of, of the topic itself. Now, um, I'm just going to skip because I'm running out of time. Um, my second research project was on the social and cultural history of the Russell-Japanese War. And this was a completely different project. And um, I really wanted to know about the ordinary people in Japan and what they thought, you know, their attitudes towards war and death and commemoration and uh, popular cultural representations of the war. And so for this particular project, 99% um, of my sources were in Japan. Um, so I spent a huge amount of time there, and I, I, I went through every single kind of um, archives at every level, national, you know, uh, prefectural, which is the county level, uh, municipal, um, local, and also I went through private collectors of postcards. I think Sujit mentioned postcards. There, there's some completely mad people collecting all sorts of things in Japan. And they're very happy to show you their collections um, and use them for, um, they're, they're often astonished that you're interested in these things as scholars because um, proper scholars are not supposed to be interested in these materials. And this is something that I experienced myself when I was doing my second work, which was that how could somebody who was a respected historian of international history deal with these popular materials because they're not real proper materials. They're not, they, they're not real historical sources. So I, I had quite a lot of problems trying to convince uh, my colleagues in Japan that what I was doing was real, his, real scholarly history, um, just as valid as what they were doing. Now, um, I'm just going to move on to my third project, um, which is on the Bandung Conference of 1955. So this has absolutely nothing to do with Japan for me. Um, and I chose this project because I'm very interested in this idea of um, understanding the symbolic in uh, international diplomacy. And so with this project, um, 
I, well, I, I'm, I'm principally interested in gathering primary sources which are readily accessible to the general, general public because I want to know how diplomacy, international diplomacy in particular, is received um, by, by, you know, general public um, all over the world. And so I, my principal sources so far have been newspapers, journals, visual materials, um, and that, that sort, you know, those genres of materials. Now for this one, I actually did get quite a good funding from thanks to the British Academy. So I went to Southeast Asia. Um, and so Singapore became my first port of call for this research. And I found Singapore incredibly important in terms of secondary literature, not, not, not as, I mean, obviously there were primary sources too, but the secondary literature on Southeast Asia, I find really rather limited um, in, in this country in relation to what I managed to find in, um, in, in Singapore. Um, and also I went to Jakarta uh, and Bandung itself, because Bandung is a city in Indonesia. And um, I accessed um, a number of things, uh, but in, 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 uh, in particular the National Library of uh, Indonesia I was able to access without a research permit, um, because the National Archives you can only access with research permit, and I didn't have one, so I was told by Indonesian scholars that I should just go to the National Library, and I did find quite a lot of interesting things there. Now, the thing about going to Southeast Asia itself is, again, I think some of our previous men uh, speakers mentioned, is the importance of um, accessing materials in situ. And this had a major impact on my approach to the study of the conference itself, because I became very interested in the idea of places in diplomacy. I, so before I went, I was looking at the Bandung Conference of 1955, which is the, you know, one of the most symbolic moments of the rise of Afro-Asia in the immediate post-colonial world. As an international historian, let's say, you know, I thought it, just like everybody else does, well, it was held in Indonesia, yeah, okay, that's good. Um, but who came? Well, Nehru came, Unu came, you know, um, Sir John Kotewala came from Ceylon. All these kind of international statesmen came. So I was more attracted to that dimension. But um, having gone to Southeast Asia, and particularly to Indonesia, I became very interested in how the Indonesians saw this um, particular conference. So I, uh, oh, okay, I got to stop now. So anyway, I, so <laughs> it's just my kind of um, bid uh, for kind of scholars to really go to the, um, to the archives in question. And just very final thing is that Japan unexpectedly became a very important source for me uh, for this project, even though I'm not looking at Japan in particular, because I had to have access to, li uh, uh, to an archive which was one of the Bandung participating countries. And Japan was the only former colonial power to be invited to this conference. So in the end, I actually managed to get quite a lot of materials from the Ministry of Foreign um, Affairs Diplomatic Archives uh, on, on on a topic which I wasn't actually expecting to, uh, to have to access Japanese archives. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Stop here. Thank you. Stop. Thank you.